The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Jennifer Schaus coming to you live from Washington, D.C. as we continue in our government contracting webinar series. This is week five out of eight, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Today is Monday, and we're going to be talking about indirect rates with Meg McKeon. Uh, this is the first of the uh, week five. Uh, the rest of the week, we are covering uh, compliant cost proposals, which I think Meg is delivering tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday, we get into section L and M of the proposal. Uh, Thursday, we cover profitability and firm fixed price contracts. And Friday, we will cover the GSA schedule uh, topic. The full list of our webinars is on our website under the webinar section. All the recordings will be posted there under the schedule. Uh, they're segmented by topic, and you can find the ones that we've done this year with the 2017 uh, recording next to them. A little bit about us. We're based in downtown D.C., provide various services for contractors, ranging from market analysis reports, capability statements, 8A certification, GSA schedule help, uh, contract compliance, and administration. Uh, throughout the year, we do host webinars, seminars, and events. You can find them on our website under either the webinar or event section, or an easier way is to sign up for our newsletter, which comes out on a weekly basis. A little bit about me here, but more importantly, I'd rather dig into Meg McKeon, who's going to be talking about indirect rates today. So, Meg, thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to turn the floor over to you, and I'll let you dig into the presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. I'm Meg McKeon. I am a uh, cost accounting assult a consultant. Excuse me. My background is as an auditor and an analyst. I worked with ECA for several years. Uh, next slide, please, Jennifer. Okay, here's a, the main work I do is in cost accounting, uh, DCA compliance, and cost proposals and DCA submissions. Next slide. All right, we're going to just jump right into how to create indirect rates. Thank you. So the, the trick to the indirect rates is that we start at the chart of accounts. This is a financial tool that is the skeleton of every accounting system. And what it does is it shows all of the accounts in an accounting system, and it does so by showing it in an order with assets and liabilities, equity, which are the balance sheet accounts, and then income and expenses. What we work with mainly is the expenses portion. The government basically reimburses expenses and then pays a fee or a profit. Next slide, please. This is a model chart of accounts. Oftentimes you'll see a chart of accounts that is really has only um, one grouping. It's, it's rare to see it actually where you, where you have it in two columns. But I wanted to give you a sense of uh, what it looks like. Next slide. All righty, so what we want to look at is how we group things together in the chart of accounts for government accounting. So it's already segregated, as we saw in the first one, where you'll see the assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expense. We just segregated a little bit more, and we are segregating basically the expenses more. So we group like expenses together, and this is the whole trick of government accounting, starting with the direct cost. Those are the costs that are going to be expended in the contracts. There's usually five or six main costs that are direct, labor, material, travel, outside services, and subcontract. Outside services and, and travel is often under what we call other direct costs. So you'll see that as one of the headings. The nice thing about the government, as many of you will know, is that they pay a fair share of the administrative expenses. So to do that and to actually get those indirect rates, we have to group those expenses together. Next slide, please. So the whole idea of creating this relationship between direct and indirect is what we call causal beneficial relationships, which means that the administrative costs either is a benefit to the base, which is uh, usually often labor or the whole cost of the company, or it's caused by that relationship. So that, for example, I, I gave some, um, 
some examples of the different pools, fringe benefits, for example, pay time off and health insurance benefit all employees. Therefore, total labor is the base of the fringe. Overhead costs um, are usually indirect expenses that benefit one specific cost, such as labor or material. And that could be, uh, as you see there, supervisors, supplies for touch labor, um, or factory shipping and receiving, depreciation, maintenance and repair, et cetera. Material overhead costs are, again, material shipping, receiving costs. Uh, larger companies tend to have the uh, subcontract cost as part of their overhead cost as well. G&A expenses serve the whole company. Uh, that's the HR, payroll, accountants, occupancy costs. Next slide, please. Unallowables. So this is a big thing about government accounting. And it's, it's there's a, a saying, and actually I think you can find it in FAR, but it's what DCA auditors use, which is what would a prudent business person do? And that's what you're going to find as basically the, the reasoning of the unallowable accounts. Next slide, you're going to see a uh, grouping of the sensitive accounts. But these are just some examples of unallowables. Sensitive accounts, basically, are, are what we call them. So this is third, FAR 31205 um, is where you're going to find the sensitive accounts. Uh, so bad debts, public relations, there's about 46. And what it means is that there's some part of those accounts that are allowable and some parts that are unallowable. Next slide. So this is one of the best charts that I want you to keep in mind that shows the difference between a common chart of accounts and a government chart of accounts. You have five expense categories in a common chart of accounts. We use nine. So the, the bottom five accounts are all the expenses. 5,000 is a very common number that's used for direct costs. 6,000 for fringe, seven for overhead, eight for G&A expenses, and then 9,000 for unallowables. Now this isn't a hard and fast rule, but what I will tell you is when a DCA auditor is starting an accounting system review, the first thing they're gonna look for is numbered accounts. So numbering the accounts is one of the best things you could do to create compliance in your chart of accounts. Next slide. So congratulations, this is really the big secret, is grouping costs together and numbering the accounts. Next slide. All right, so there's a whole bunch on this slide, but basically what we're talking about is the numbering. The bigger the system, the more accounts need to be modified. Here's where you get down into the nitty gritty. When you're changing your chart of accounts, whether you have it numbered and you're going to use more segregated numbering or whether you've never numbered it, you have to go into each account separately. So that takes about 30 seconds for each account. That's where the real work of this happens. So what I suggest is when you are modifying a chart of account, you first take a copy of the account and throw it into Excel, um, and the whole chart of accounts, and then you basically make a copy of that and number that first. Uh, it can get very confusing when you're in the middle of actually modifying accounts. So if you have a model to use, it's one of the best ways to work on it. Again, this last bullet is a big part of what we talk about. Uh, adequacy reviews are becoming a much more common in the government. They're kind of going back to it. Um, there are certain ones, for example, if you're doing a SIBR phase two, you have to pass a, a uh, accounting system adequacy review. Um, you could definitely lose that contract if you do not have an adequate accounting system. So this is one of the main reasons we want to do this. But this is also really how the government works with cost accounting systems. Thank you. Next slide, Jennifer. So easy segregation of pools and determining indirect rates. We're using just very common rates that are usually found, whether you're a large company or a small company. Fringe rates. Basically, uh, fringe rates are total benefits. 
And that means that you can have benefits that, let's say, maybe serve the executives more than the rest of the company. However, they still are divided over total labor. Overhead rates are costs that benefit usually your direct labor, again, or your direct material. G&A rates is really what uh, is different from these other rates. It doesn't have a single base element. What we call it is a total cost input base. So that really means that that is the total cost besides what is actually in your G&A expenses. So a trick is that your, your G&A pool, which is made up of the G&A pool and the G&A base, should equal the total expenses of the company other than unallowables. So unallowables do not have a rate. They can be identified by the type of, of cost they are, meaning they could be a fringe cost, an over rate, overhead cost, or a GNA cost. However, most unallowables tend to fall into the GNA pool. If you number them separately, it's one of the best ways to show compliance to government cost accounting, which is why we often use the 9,000 numbers. Next slide. So total cost input base. As I mentioned earlier, this is really all cost other than your G&A pool cost, even the unallowables. Basically, unallowables are going to either fall into the G&A pool, as I mentioned earlier, or they're going to be in the G&A base because they would have been related to the fringe or overhead cost. They do tend to be for the whole company. So one of the things that we talk about uh, as auditors is clean pool, dirty base. And this is specifically true of the G&A. You want to see everything in that base. Um, but the pools are made up of specific costs that uh, are beneficial to certain groups in the company. Next slide. Okay, this is uh, the last slide. And Jennifer, if you could open the Excel sheet. Um, we're actually doing uh, really well on time. So I wanna go through this uh, and it's gonna just take a minute. So this is a trick that we use to actually determine the indirect rates. You take basically the cost in your chart of accounts. And as you can see here, this is a very well segregated chart of accounts. We're only dealing with the expenses. On the top, we put the fringe pool and base, overhead pool and base, G&A pool and base, and then unallowable pool and base. So cost of goods sold, what we have under here is just the direct labor. So direct labor actually falls in as a base to all of the three pools. If we had material cost and ODC cost, those would only be part of the G&A base unless you had a material overhead pool, and then the material cost would be the only base of that G&A material pool, I'm sorry, the overhead material pool. Then we get down into the expenses. So we see the 6,000 expenses. We've got a few of the, uh, the fringe expenses here, and you see that those fringe expenses then hit the, the pool part of fringe. They also, though, are divided between overhead and G&A. Now this little calculation, uh, what we do is we do a manual calculation to determine how much of the fringe cost hit the, the G&A or the overhead pools based on the base of labor, in this case, found in overhead and G&A. So as you see here, um, this will be divided between those costs. Whatever is not in the pool of GNA then becomes uh, calculated in the base of GNA. So if we scroll down a little bit more, we'll get into the overhead. There's not that many accounts in the overhead pool. This is common for a service company, although a lot of service companies tend to put their, their computer, internet, uh, you still may have some uh, maintenance and repair depreciation in your overhead pool and that's because it's again whatever 
your labor force is working with. So if you have a labor force that's mainly, let's say, IT and, and their engineers, then you're going to have all of their computers in there. Uh, oftentimes, occupancy costs are considered an intermediate pool. And so you'll see some occupancy costs that's hitting the overhead pool. And that will be basically the square footage that most of the direct employees are sitting in. Again, though, we see that the overhead labor is hitting the base of the fringe. And I apologize that uh, this, this sheet does not show you on top that we're still looking at fringe pool, overhead pool, and GNA pool. I don't know if we can freeze that, Jennifer, if you have access to, to play with that. If not, we'll just keep going with it. So then you see that basically the labor is still on the overhead part of the, the base. So G&A, again, for most small companies, you're going to see a whole lot of the expenses in your G&A pool. That also includes all of your executive labor and company meetings. Here's the real trick to segregating costs for government contracting is how many labor accounts you've set up and where you set that up. So in overhead, your labor is gonna be mainly, you can have program managers, uh, supervisors. Many companies, if they're a manufacturing company, will um, make all of their engineers indirect. So then you'll have engineering labor as part of your overhead pool. Um, then in the G&A pool, you have your executives, uh, you may have administrative assistants, your human resource folks, your accounting, payroll. Um, very common to have company meetings and trainings. Anything where you're the, everybody in the company is going to gather for something, you want to have a labor account for that so you're tracking their time. So you see common other expenses such as automobile expenses, uh, banking services. Uh, two accounts that are very, very good to have in your chart of accounts is BNP, which is the bid and proposal, and IR&D. Small companies tend to overlook these accounts, and uh, they're very important. Uh, we expect them as auditors. Do some subscriptions. Uh, if we could scroll down a little bit more. As you can see in column K, all these accounts are hitting this column. This is the pool side of the G&A pool, as we say. You know, we're always calling a pool and base the pool. And when we talk about indirect rates, it's that, that ratio between the pool and base, but it'll be known as the fringe rate, overhead rate, G&A rate. Down here, again, we have more office supplies. Insurance is often common. Outside services, that could be uh, your legal or accountants. Rent is, you're getting more into some of the occupancy costs. We can scroll down just a little further, Jennifer. We'll get into the 9,000s. So, and this is how you'll normally see it if you have segregated your costs and it's showing your unallowables last. And as we see that, this M is actually the pool of the unallowables. And they are all basically G&A pool expenses. So down at the bottom, basically you're just calculating the totals of these columns and you get the rates. So this is a 10% fringe rate, 3% overhead rate, and 11% G&A rates. Now these are very low rates, but it does give you a sense of how to quickly find your indirect rates based on your actual cost and how to show it. Um, my experience is once I've done this, no matter how I comprise the rates, I'm seeing the same rates. So uh, that was the last sheet of our uh, presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please contact me. And I know I ran through it quickly. We've got a short time period. Uh, lots of good stuff in here. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. Thank Great. You, thanks, Meg. It was certainly a thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Meg's contact information is here on the slide. So if you have questions or want copies of uh, just the PowerPoint or uh, any other information, please contact Meg directly. Uh, tomorrow we are covering compliant cost proposals. 
uh, and the rest of the week we are touching on Section L and M of the proposal, profitability, and firm fixed price contracts, and GSA schedules. All of our webinars are complimentary, and they are recorded, so should you have missed any part of this webinar or any others in the past, you can download those off of our site under the webinar section. Thanks again, everybody.